the, welcome to the new people uh, who are here for the first time. It's great to see you. Um, and I thought I'd read a poem um, just to kick it off um, about what it is to be a poet. Obviously, this is from my view, um, but it's called A Celebration of the Poet. I see clouds as friends, sunsets as goodbyes, sunrises as infinite possibilities for the new. I believe the sea's constant motion moves us closer to an understanding of ourselves. I am on the moon and fly to the sun. I have no confines in my mind. I can run anywhere. Light creates shadows that long impress romance on the water, menace in dark corners. I dance on ledges others walk past. I scale the walls of introspection and dive from the highest cliff to land on paper with ink. I live for a moody grey day. Equally, the sun by the sea, the waning light as it catches glimpses of tomorrow. I converse with possibilities, I think in infinity, I drown with limitations, I strive for beyond. I breathe life into moments that would otherwise lie dormant. I belong to no one but the wind of inspiration and the sea of what can be. I am a poet. Do you read me? I'd like to um, welcome someone who comes to these events uh, regularly and wonderfully, and we're very glad that she does. She's um, a wonderful reader, speaker, local artist, and she's got a voice that just makes you melt. So give a hand to Rhoda Zeffert. Well, this is a. Uh, I'm into comedy tonight. So this is called The Mirror. And it was written, it was written in the 1700s, right, by a gentleman called Edmund Burke. Put that down a bit. I look in the mirror, and what do I see? A strange looking person. Oh, that cannot be me. <laughs> For I am much younger, not nearly so fat as that face in the mirror I am looking at. Oh, where are the mirrors that I used to know? Like the ones which were made 30 years ago. Now, all things have changed, and I'm sure you'll agree, mirrors are not as good as they used to be. <laughs> So, never be concerned if wrinkles appear. For one thing I've learned, which is very clear, should your complexion be less than perfection, it is really the mirror that needs correction. Brilliant row, always different and always daring to be different. Um, so now I'd like to welcome a really great poet from Ashurst Wood, um, Alison Saunders. She comes uh, to the poetry event regularly and always uh, delights with her poetry. So please give a warm welcome to Alison Saunders. A lot of my poems, as I've said before, come to me at sort of three or four in the morning virtually fully formed, as this one did. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek. Four sisters. Jane, Jean, June and Joan were four sisters who were never alone. Jean, June, Joan and Jane, four sisters who looked the same. June, Joan, Jane and Jean always wore the colour green. Joan, Jane, Jean and June always sang the same old tune. It all began with their mother, Jan. <laughs> it all changed when younger sister, Jen, was born. Their father, John, was soon long gone. So their brother, Jim, 
decided it was up to him to save the day. So he went away and joined the Navy with his Uncle Davy. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, and now to introduce our star poet for tonight. I'd like to uh, ask Neil to come up. He's going to give an introduction for Jill. Thank you. Mm. Neil Lennon. from a strong Celtic line of traditional Irish customs, stories and songs. She writes to bring pleasure to others and for the continuity of a simple way of living and entertainment. She sees herself as a spiritual person, very grounded and connected with life. She's grateful to be married to the gentlest of men who takes care of everything allowing her time to splurge on writing. When not writing, her pleasures are walks in the country with friends, followed by a nice cup of tea and a chat at the end. Her poems are story poems for the coffee table, covering areas of human nature, childhood, beauty, betrayal, loss, gardening, the world around us, a capture of life's moments. She hopes they encourage people to seek the beauty of their surroundings. For this reason, they align closely with Irish poet John O'Donoghue, Brendan Kennelly, and Seamus Heaney. Thank you. And now, of course, that without any further ado, Jeff, yeah, please come up. Thank you, Neil. That was read in true Aussie style. We've got a blending of Australia and Ireland and England and Scotland and Wales and um, a lot of other places. Um, so this book is actually a product of Word Lovers Night, really, because Angie and Neil and Dave um, and I come to most of them. Uh, we started the Word Lovers Night, and and we come and um, from and the first night I came to Word Lovers, and she says, "Why don't we get a group of poets together? You know, bring about five poems." And I thought, five poems? I have about three. <laughs> like, where am I going to get five poems? And now I have about two hundred. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. 69 of them feature in this book and um, yeah it came from just having the confidence to confidence in the words and um, so I grew up in the country of Ireland as we have mentioned and I've been so lucky because my grandfather was a storyteller and my father told stories and these were handed down my grandfather told stories and they weren't he didn't have the luxury of reading them from a book. They were just remembered from what he had heard. And then my dad told stories because his father told him and that was remembering what he had heard with a few additions here and there probably. And then I grew up and um, my, I was, my mom died when I was young so then we went to live with my uncle. And he, um, he ran a house which was called a rambling house. So. It was basically an open house and uh, people had, you could just come and walk in. You didn't have to say I'm coming around or anything, you just walked in after seven o'clock at night. So three people might turn up, eight people might turn up, they might play cards or they might sit around and talk. What fascinated me about that and sitting listening was they were all just from a radius of about three miles away. And they would detect a different accent from one mile away. And they would slag off the accent from one mile away. It was fascinating. <laughs> and uh, they were quite creative. Um, 
So one uh, neighbor, for example, he had a farm of land, but one of his fields was cut off. It was some field he bought later on, and his field was much farther away from the farm. And um, he, called that, he called that field Canada. You know, so he said, I had to go up to Canada for the cows today. And I was like, <laughs> the following day, I was like saying to my uncle, why did Tom have to go to Canada? He said, oh, that's what he calls his field, you know. But just grew up with that kind of imagination with people. Um, it was wonderful. And uh, so between a combination of that, combination of wanting to keep this tradition going, and uh, I want people just to um, be able to sit around and entertain each other, rather than play games or, you know, on the computers or on the phones the whole time. I, I really want to bring back this way of, in, of communicating, being together. So I think I've enough done talking. I will um, do a poem. Um, still getting used to this mic two years later. So the first poem is... Um, this is a poem that's written from the viewpoint of a dog, because when I was in the country, we had one dog, and he was amazing. I don't know who trained him. He was a sheepdog. And as soon as he got the, the idea that there was some milking time, he just did the business. He would up, collected the cows, and brought them back. Amazing. So this is his viewpoint. It's called a working dog. Good morning, world. My spirit soar, I stretch and open all my pores. Noise and action about the house, I think it's time to fetch my cows. Up the hills I roam with freedom, an easy job, don't need to see them. I smelt them earlier on the wind, so now I surprise them with barks. I send them scarping to the barn, oh how I love my work. Who would not be a working dog? Wild Blue thinks she'll double back. Not on my watch. My feet are fast. I heard her change of mind before her. It took some time for her body to follow. She has no chance. I'm skilled and true. He'll not turn back on me, Wild Blue. She gets it. Falls in with the herd. Thoughts are fun. No need for words. Humans shout and scream so much. Really? A waste of effort and throats. <laughs> We heard your thoughts some time ago. No need to shout which way to go. Just think straight thoughts. Think one at a time. And then we can all get along just fine. <laughs> Thank you. The next one I'll read is a little bit long. If you'll indulge me, it's about three and a half minutes or so. Um, and it's called The Newspapers on the Floor, which is the name of the book, The Newspapers on the Floor. Um, this was actually written about 30 years ago. Um, and the idea is um, we grew up in a country kitchen, weekend was for washing, we washed the concrete floor, we didn't have carpets or nothing. And the quickest way to dry a floor is throw newspapers on it. And to be quite honest, it's the best use for newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is based on the Limerick leader, but it can relate to, um, you can relate to, whatever, here we go. It's called the newspapers on the floor. The weekend activities have begun, the pot boils on the hob, as water and polish are required for all the little jobs. And now the concrete floor is scrubbed, and to keep it clean this way, we place upon it newspapers we've read from yesterday. But as we place them underneath our feet, we stop and gaze. Sure, we haven't read these news items, now seen before our face. For when these papers are spread about, they seem to contain much lower. Yes, news is more entertaining from the newspapers on the floor. We stand on John B's profile and mash him to the ground. We read of local races with foxes, dogs, and hounds. We see again the week's events we thought we'd read before, but they're juicier than ever from the newspapers on the floor. We dance upon the local team who've beaten us last week. We walk upon the captain now, leave mud upon his cheek. We read again of a hand's great men, and <laughs> laugh now at the score. They don't look half so brave and strong from the newspapers on the floor. 
From Ryan's rural roundabout, friends' faces can be seen, laughing at our clumsiness and keeping our houses clean. The names of dear ones, past and gone, are now prayed for, or and or, as their memories come fresh to mind from the newspapers on the floor. As children, too, what games we played as we skipped and chased, or danced upon a face we knew sitting helplessly in place, or jumped across that yawning depth which beneath the pages glowered. What fun we had, twas good be dead, on the newspapers on the floor. A wedding dress, once brave and white without a mark or stain, now finds herself a sorry sight as she mops up mud and rain. But she'll never be put to better use. She now rests inside the door, drying water from strong working boots from the newspapers on the floor. We read of Joe Hogan, a local man building houses by the score. We see notes from faraway places, Ballysteen and Capamore. Local carnivals are running now, marquees and dances galore. Should we live our lives in ignorance without the newspapers on the floor? And if news you're wanting after this, call to a neighbour's house for tea. As you chat about the day's events, go down upon one knee. For she's just after washing too. And as your tea she pours, she finds you looking not at her, but her newspapers on the floor. <laughs> and late at night, when all work's done and our bones are weary and tired, we bundle up these newspapers and toss them to the fire. And how relaxed and warm we feel as the flames glow red and soar along with all our thanksgivings and the newspapers on the floor. Oh. Thank you. Um, shall I do one more? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, on, on this uh, book, the layout I'm quite happy with because um, I have so many poems and uh, I was wondering how am I going to put them in any kind of order. And I tossed and turned with this and I had a floor full of papers all over it. And um, then one morning I grew up with a flash of inspiration and I thought most of these poems are about, they hark back to the landscape I grew up in. And so I thought, why don't I lay out the book in the same way as the landscape I grew up in? And so, I personally am quite happy <laughs> with the contents. So, the first batch of poems is called Grove of Trees, so it's all on nature and trees. I have another batch and they're called Church Bells because the church bell rang across those hills. I have another batch called Stone Age Bogland Treasures because we dug the bog and we found uh, Stone Age implements and uh, a patch of ground where Stone Age people had a, a home. And then I have a chapter called Back the Road, uh, because we were always sent back the road for anything. Uh, so then I have a chapter called Summer Days, and these are mostly about summer holidays and swimming in the river. And then we finish off relaxing by the lake, so it's softer, warmer poems. Um, that's because there was a lake as well on the land. So that's the layout of the book. Uh, I'll finish with this poem for now, and it's called Standing on Shoulders of Giants. Sadie was exploring with her daughter as they stood on the large stones by the cliff. Sorry, I'll start again. This is written, um, you know, did you ever go to a place and, uh, you know, you wonder what happened here before? Um, and like, I'm standing here, but who else stood here before? What could possibly have happened in this same spot? And uh, just like, it's, it's amazing to try and do it. And it just, um, yeah, it it's, connects you up with all sorts of things. So that was the, the idea of this. So I'll start again. Standing on shoulders of giants. Sadie was exploring with her daughter as they stood on large stones by the cliff. The history of these stones goes back 6,000 years. 6,000 years ago, strong men stood on this exact spot. Mom, you're right. I'm standing on his shoulders. Her perceptive daughter was ecstatic. They shared a playful look and a playful urge. 
they let themselves tune in to the story of the stone, to when it formed the proud top of a doorway, to earlier as the anchor point for ships, to earlier when it housed a cave lion, to earlier when it formed the tombstone of a king, to earlier when it was the bed of a dragon, down, on down they travelled, excited, unafraid, together, holding hands, fully here and fully there, forming connections with ease by the stones neath their feet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jo. Jo will be reading more from her debut anthology, Newspapers on the Floor, in the second half of the event as well. But now I'd like to, we always have um, storytellers in the form of musicians uh, in the, for the poetry event. Um, and tonight we're very, uh, it's our first time to have Delphus with us, that's Mike and Julia. A warm welcome to Delphus who are going to sing some songs for us. Sing Black is the Colour, which is a Scottish folk song. Although I know it from an Irish folk singer, but we...
like to introduce, um, ask Rhoda to come up. She's going to read another piece. I don't know how she's going to read it, but it's going to be brilliant. <laughs> I don't know how you poets create all the wonderful works that you do. It's just beyond me. It's wonderful. Thank you. Now, I'm going to read another funny one. Um, it's called Smiling is Infectious. And it's possibly by Spike Milligan, whom a lot of you will know. But there is a little bit of uncertainty about whether he actually wrote it. But I think it's fun. Smiling is infectious. You catch it like the flu. When someone smiled at me today, I started smiling too. <laughs> I passed around the corner and someone saw my grin. When he smiled, I realized I passed it on to him. I thought about that smile then I realized it's worth. A single smile, just like mine, could travel round the earth. So, if you feel a smile begin, don't leave it undetected. Let's start an epidemic quick and get the world infected. Yeah! <laughs> Brilliant. That's a good type of infection. So now I'd like to give a, if everyone could give a warm welcome to uh, Tim Lyons, who's a regular poet here, and he's got a couple of um, poems, which he's printed tonight, which is wonderful, normally on my book. Hello, well, actually, I, I didn't print this one. <laughs> that's, a, that's a book. Oh, yeah, I have to move it up there. Um, but yeah, this one's one of mine. Um, because this is kind of Jer's night, I thought I'd do one that's kind of in some way related to hers, and I thought the word nostalgic was the, the kind of main word I was thinking of that was summing up quite a lot of your work. Um, it turns out I don't actually have very many nostalgic poems. I found one. <laughs> um, but yeah, here we go. It's called Don't Rock. At the peak of the first of ten tours, thinking that I'm going to fall, wishing I was on all fours, but forcing myself to stand tall. I'm thinking, I used to always look forward to the next climb, but something's changed, something feels strange. Standing on a rock on a hill, wanting to jump to the next, but standing frozen still, looking like I want to reflect. But I'm thinking, I used to jump from rock to rock, all the time, but something's changed. Something feels strange. Okay. So that's that one. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask Neil. Neil, are you around? Yeah. Um, so Neil's going to do, um, two, has two little sections here. He's going to read a poem of his own first, and then he's going to read two of Jer's poems. Thanks. Yes, that's sort of the order up. <laughs> okay, this one's called Poets. Who do we think we are? Poets, not prophets. Sayers, not seers. We seek the enemy, because we know he's there. We revel the heroes, cut them their share. Maybe a little over the top sometimes, but only in fascinated empathy and woven, intricate care. Not just the pretty things, mind. Ugly things, too, fall under our word and vision. From the wafting, congealing, putrefying aftermath of death rising from a battlefield of broken bodies, <laughs> to the glorious, thrusting, hedonistic heights of tongue-laden golden passion rising from the heat and silken sheets of a quiet bedchamber. Oh, yes. <laughs> We can be clever dicks indeed. <laughs> and every now and then, someone listens and something changes. Hmm. However small or large the effect, we can smile. <laughs> but what of the effect? Black words can clear an audience, 
Frightened words can let loose a storming. Glorious words can claim a mountain or find the smallest spark of lost courage in the heart of a defeated man. Reflected, examined, extolled, or vilified, life is still life in its infinite pot. We stir the stirrings, weave the weavings, leave the leavings. We are the Lord guardians of time and the Lord loyal keepers of imagination. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Now, it is my absolute honour and privilege to read a couple of Joe's poems from the book. And uh, the first one I'd like to read is called Karma. I love growing old, as I get to see karma unfold. I helped a young girl with a tool that I had. When her tummy was sore, we made it no more. Years later, my dad was sick, sore and sad, fell to the floor hurt his leg and his bones. This girl was now a nurse and feels for his pulse. She restored life to his knee, not knowing that he was related to me who had set her pain free. I love growing old as I get to see karma unfold. I also saw karma in ways more alarming. A guy told a lie and took for his bride my friend for wrong reason, her property appealing. When they got engaged, his face swelled up with pain. A warning display, this was not a good game. Years rolled on by and my friend discovered the why. Left that bad guy, well, didn't he up and die? So now I should mention, she has a good widow's pension. <laughs> Karma is real. A spin of the wheel. <laughs> All right, this one's called The Giant. Neil brings things to life. Ah, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> They're all there to be brought. Okay, this is The Giant. Now, I really get this is Ireland in its majesty and beauty and just simplicity and gorgeousness of, of colour and field and pastoral passion. Here we go. It was just a hill field to the neighbours, but we knew it as the bed of the giant. And when he was heavily breathing, his breath shaped a fog over the land. It was rare that anyone saw him. Sleep was what he did best. It seems he was old and a tired giant, so we should keep very quiet and let him rest. Most folk saw just a green hill field. We saw giant's head and feet and ogled at that large heaving belly and wondered when and how we would meet. So we tiptoed past his bed in the morning and ran past it scared late at night and we watched every move, every heaving. That giant's bed filled us with fright. I then moved away from that hillside, returning years later to visit some kin. Out of curiosity, I checked on the giant, saw nothing but a hill field of green. My daughter was with me, however. I felt nothing, but as we were leaving, she pulled on my arm in excitement. I'm wait, I can hear the giant breathing. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'd like to ask um, Barry White, Jez's other half, to come up. And um, he's going to read a poem. Um, it's not one he's written, I believe, that he's going to read for you. So please give a warm welcome to Barry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay, uh, this is a poem by Seamus Heaney who was one of Jared's influences, really. Uh, and it's these books, uh, this little group of poems, they back to the actual 1960s. So uh, I just choose one for them, or just one poem here called The After Follower. It's about a uh, man and his son, and then the man again. 
follower. My father worked with a horse plow. His shoulders globed like a full sail strung. Between the shafts and the furrow, the horses strained as clicking tongue. An expert, he would set the wing and fit the bright steel pointed sock. The sod rolled over without breaking at the head rig with a single pluck of reins. The sweating team turned round and back into the land. His eye narrowed an angle at the ground, mapping the furrow exactly. I stumbled in his hobnailed wake, fell sometimes on the polished sod, sometimes he rode me on his back, dipping and rising to his plod. I wanted to grow up and plough, to close one eye, stiffen my arm. All I ever did was follow in this broad shadow round the farm. I was a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping always. But today, it's my father who keeps stumbling behind me and will not go away. Thank you. And now I'm told Master Phillips would like to come up and read. Oh, oh, yeah. It's not often he comes up, so give me Mm. <laughs> well, I was asked to do this actually because I did it. Uh, some of you know we did a, a Zoom, some Zoom meetings when um, during the lockdown, and uh, I'd never done anything like this before. So I thought that'll be brave. I can do it on Zoom. <laughs> but Jim, <laughs> Jim has asked me to do it live tonight. So, um, so some of you have heard it before, but I mean, it's the Ballad of Sweeney Todd. Um, it's, the, it's the lyrics from the Stephen Sondheim show. Um, it appears in the, in the uh, show quite a few times. I've just amalgamated it all into one run. So, okay, this is the Ballad of Sweeney Todd. A tender tale of Sweeney Todd. His skin was pale and his eye was odd. He shaved the faces of gentlemen who never thereafter were seen again. He trod a path that through her trod this Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. He kept a shop in London town of fancy clients and good renown. And what if they nonetheless souls were saved? They went to the maker, impeccably shaped <laughs> by Sweeney, Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Swing your razor high, Sweeney. Hold it to the sky. Freely flows the blood of those who moralize. His needs were few, his room was bare. A lava bowl and a fancy chair. A mug of suds, a leather strop. An apron, a towel, a power and a mop. For neatness, he deserves a nod. The Sweeney Todd, the be demon barber of Fleet Street. Inconspicuous being Sweeney he was, quick and quiet and clean he was. Back of his smile, under his word, Sweeney heard music nobody heard. Sweeney pondered and Sweeney planned, like a perfect machine he planned. Sweeney was smooth and Sweeney was subtle. Sweeney would blink and the rats would scuffle. Sweeney, Sweeney, Sweeney. <laughs> Lift your razor high, Sweeney, hear it singing, yes. Stick it in the rosy skin of righteousness. His voice was soft, his manner mild. He seldom laughed, but he often smiled. He had seen how civilised men behave. He never forgot and he never forgave. Not Sweeney, not Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. His hands were quick and his fingers strong. It stung for a little, but not for long. <laughs> and all those that fought him a simple clod were soon reconsidering under the sod. <laughs> to find there with a friendly prod by Sweeney, Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. A tender tale of Sweeney Todd. He served a dark and vengeful God. What happened then? Well, that's the play. And he wouldn't want me to give it away. <laughs> Not Sweeney, Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. 
So um, I'd like to invite Jo to come back up and read some more poems, and then after Jo we'll have a couple more songs, and then a chance to um, to go and see Jo's book and touch it and feel it and open it and read it. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Wow, everyone having a good night? Yes. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I think we're back in power tonight. We had uh, we had to do a few on Zoom through the years, as Dave mentioned, but it's so lovely to be back live. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, so I, I have, um, the next one is a very short one, um, so I was very lucky, I'm just so lucky, it's such a beautiful childhood, and um, my Uncle Dan minded us, and uh, he had these huge boots, he had these huge feet, his feet were actually only size nine, but he was a funny man, he was so gentle. Once he went to buy new shoes, and uh, he came home with size 11s. And uh, I said, why, what's with the size 9s? They didn't have size 9, 10, didn't have 10. So he came home with size 11 shoes. <laughs> so he, he wore five or six pairs of socks to uh, wear these boots. Um, so I was a small child, um, I don't know, six or seven, I suppose, and um, I would love to stand on these boots. So he had these huge boots, so I was a child and I just, this is the poem, Uncle Dan's Boots. Stand on my boots, he said. I balance carefully. I can only reach around his knee. I'm careful not to let him see. The joy upon my face to share this special place with the best man <laughs> with the best man on the land with my lovely Uncle Dan. Wow. Thank you. The next one, um, just kind of a bit of fun with. I love scones. Who here likes scones? Yeah. Scones or scones? Scones in Scotland. And uh, this is called the humble. It has to be scone because this is the way the poem goes. <laughs> Every sensation in the world I've known could all be embodied in one current scone. With layers of butter it melts on my tongue, it slides down my throat, the journey's begun. <laughs> Awakened her taste buds who come dressed to meet it like a royal procession with teeth doing greetings. My gullet is opening, succumbing to raisins, all logical guarded, promises forsaken. <laughs> a current, a crumb wriggles on down. Awakening thunder of stomach is drowned by flowering, sensuous tastings divine. No liquor is needed. These feelings outshine it. Exploring the depths, finding new sensations. Who would have thought that it's gone? could create such a world of discovery, enchantment, treasure. An awakening of dormant and illustrious pleasures, all coming awake with one bite of a scone. We cannot stop now, all doors have been opened. <laughs> Let's push aside all that logic that frazzles our days and relax to the soothingly, magical, caressingly sensuous feeling of taste. Oh, Got to have some fun, huh? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is the last poem in my book. This is called Don't Forget to Write. So um, these days we have so much communication and ways of communicating and we have texts and WhatsApp and Zoom and all sorts of things. But when I was growing up in uh, the near 60s, 70s, when I was growing up, <coughs> We, um, it, was, it was sad times in Ireland as well, so my neighbour, um, she was Mrs Shanahan, but her children went to England to get work. And um, when the people left just to go, just across the water, they probably would never be seen again. So it was kind of like a wake when, when children went away. And um, the best you could get was a letter. You could get a letter definitely at Christmas but at Easter and other times during the year, 
she would be looking out and waiting for these letters to come. And a letter meant so much. Um, so this is a little bit what this poem is about. Oops, it is. It's called Don't Forget to Write. And it's the last poem in my book. And I, I put it last deliberately because uh, let's not all forget to write. You know, let's keep writing forever. OK, don't forget to write. It's not like we forget, more like we never intended. Yet mothers wait for the postman at the gate. Any news from abroad? They're all doing great. Then mom hides her tears and swallows her fears. How quickly they forget the love nest she set. She taught them their letters, they ought to know better. So each day she waits for the post by the gate praying with all her might that they won't forget to write. Thank you. Sorry for finishing the sentence. It's just so wonderful to see art coming to life, and it's great you're reading your poetry, Joe. It's fantastic. So I wish you all the best. I think we all wish you all the best for a very, very successful sales and uh, for the future of that book. May you read loads more. and hand you over to Julia and Mike, you've got beautiful words to sing and we'll take us out for the evening. Delphus, thank you. Yay. Um, the first one is interesting, the poem, your penultimate poem. Um, it's actually, Mike wrote it and it's kind of an Irish thing. And it's, it's about somebody being in Ireland and somebody leaving Ireland. So it's kind of like about what you're So oh.